Hello, everyone. Hello, psychology undergraduate students. Um, thank you for being here with us today. Some of you have known me from the office. I'm giving you all a virtual hug and a nice hello. Today, we'll be discussing graduate programs in psychology. Uh, but before we do that, I want to take a moment of silence to acknowledge the horrific events happening in our country, um, the killing of our Black American people by the police. And I hope we all engage in social activism work and in our classes and through education could be the weapon to social justice and racial justice at John Jay and around the world. So let's take a moment of silence. Thank you all. And it is my pleasure um, to give the floor to Dr. Daryl Wout, our psychology chair, um, our leader of our department. And because of him, we are here today. Hello, everyone. I'm just uh, happy you all were able to attend today. Um, I haven't been able to teach this year, so it's it's nice to just um, be in a, in a somewhat of a classroom setting with students, so this is nice. Um, I want to first thank all of our directors of our uh, programs who are willing to come and talk about their programs today. It's really important for us as a department to make sure that our undergraduates are aware of um, all the different opportunities that we have for graduate programs here. And we'll have some um, future seminars talking about applying to graduate school, um, non-academic career options. So um, be on the lookout for um, other events that will be coming up um, in the next couple of weeks. Um, I don't want to take up much of your time. I want to make sure there's a lot of room for questions if you have any. So I am going to turn over to Dr. Falkenbach to talk about um, the first of our MA programs. Hi, welcome everyone. I am Dr. Diana Falkenbach and I'm the director of the MA program in forensic psychology here in, at John Jay. So our program is really committed to diversity, equity, and, and inclusion with our forensic psychology curriculum, really highlighting the various ways in which social identities can impact our understanding and implementation of the intersection of psychology and law. So that's a big, long sentence. But really what it comes down to is we're really looking at our program as sort of the psychological parts um, of, of the legal system. And this is very, very broad. Um, we have people working on policing issues. We have people working on jury se selection. I just did a, an observation on someone talking about memory. Um, I work on psychopathy, people doing all kinds of issues on profiling. Pick an area that psychology and law overlaps and that's basically what our program is highlighting. So we are a 42 credit program and it really is designed to train practitioners to provide psychology services to and within the criminal justice and social justice systems, as well as to prepare students for doctoral study in psychology. So our students generally take one or the other path. They go out and practice or they go on to further study. Uh, so, so through our coursework, students are provided with advanced understanding of psychological development, personality theory, um, psychopathology, assessment, uh, psychotherapeutic techniques, and research methods all within forensic psychology context. Um, and then all students have to do a 300 hour externship placement and or uh, an independent research thesis project um, for their capstone experience. So there are 42 credits worth of courses and those include those two capstone experiences. Um, most of our students go on to work um, or study in uh, one of three areas. One is many go on to doctoral um, and sometimes law degrees um, and then and move forward from there into academia, law practice or research. Um, alternatively, they find jobs in mental health settings such as jails, forensic hospitals, mental health courts. Um, and then the third area that many of our students go on to is more investigative law enforcement positions at the local, state, and federal level. Um, so um, what I will say about that is we have a good portion of our students that are applying to our program because they're interested specifically in those um, three-letter agencies like the FBI, CIA, et cetera. And we do have students that go on to that work. 
Um, what I will say though about that is that we, uh, you know, we have a whole profiling track. Students can take profiling courses. They can get all of that material. But the, that job of that FBI profiler that a lot of students are looking to get to is, is a very rare and not um, very reliable job out there in the real world. So um, we, we have lots of material and you can learn all about that. And lots of our students go on to work for the FBI. They don't necessarily end up as one of three people in the entire world that are the FBI profilers, as you know, people kind of know that. Um, just quickly, our application requirements are a minimum GPA of 3.0 um, and typically a combined GRE score of 297. Now we are currently waiving the GRE requirement um, and I'm not sure what we will do for that in the future. It hasn't been discussed beyond the fall admissions for this year, um, but it will be on the table for discussion once we, um, once we finish this fall's um, application process. Um, also, students need to submit a um, reference, uh, three letters of academic reference and a personal statement. And we are looking for students to have um, successfully completed 12 credits in psychology, as well as statistics and research methods. That that requirement um, is a minimum and you are allowed to be admitted conditionally if you're missing one of those requirements. So if, if you have all about maybe one of those, not a big deal, we can sort of work through that, but, um, but that is the basic requirement before you can kind of go on to full-time status within the program. Um, we are currently accepting um, applications for fall entry for fall 2021, and that deadline is May 1st. And then they'll have a separate entrance um, application process for with a deadline of um, December 1st, typically for spring admissions. So we have two admission cycles per year, um, and that is every year. So there is my um, short synopsis of our program. Anila, I just sent you a slide deck that you can attach for people that's got lots of details about the program that we usually use for open houses. And I'll be here for questions. Thank you, Dr. Falkenbach. Uh, the PowerPoint is in the chat, as some of you noticed. Thank you very much. We will move to Dr. Ragova. Thank you so much. Hi, folks. First, you should congratulate yourselves for coming. Um, that's an enormous first step and an exciting one. Um, and so I, you know, I'm going to start this by saying it's often very confusing when you're trying to figure out what you want to do um, in psychology. And in part, it's confusing because the way to think about this is there's many different clubs and each club produces a particular degree. So you have masters in social work, and that's one club. You have masters in psychology, that's another club. I'm distracted by Anila's baby, that's a separate mother's club. There's a masters in um, counseling psychology, which is what um, I'm working with here, um, which is, and so how do you decide which one of these programs is right for you? And how are they different? Um, the differences are really subtle and I'm, you know, and in a way you're not really going to understand them at today's meeting, but I think sort of the overall ways in which they're different, um, there's sort of two things and one is the number of credits and the other is what you can do with the degree formally and what you can do with the degree informally. Those are different things. So what is, first of all, FMHC? Um, it's it's this interesting degree, I think it might be the only one in the country actually, where there's, where you get it, it's at the crossroads of counseling psychology and law. And so how, how is this different from, for example, a master's in psychology or a master's in um, other kinds of degrees? So the first maybe most important difference is it allows you to get a license and practice independently. Now, I don't really expect you to understand what that means fully, but it's at this point, because I certainly wouldn't have as an undergrad. But the idea is something like this. Supposing you get your master's and you want to set up a business and you want to see clients. Whether you're a dentist, a lawyer, or a psychologist, you need to take an exam and get licensed. And so some degrees allow licensure and some degrees don't. The reasons for those are political and historical, um, not, not actually substantive. But for historical reasons, 
mental health counseling lets you get a license and lets you practice independently without a supervisor. Um, now, it's a very new degree, new meaning new in the US. It's about 10 years old. And in some ways, you know, master's degrees are becoming the to go for degrees in psychology. And um, it is, it, it, master's degrees are really running all our not for profits. Um, they're really important, for example, in, um, in, with police. They're important in prisons and parole boards, um, in domestic violence shelters, homeless shelters, and the court system. All of these are places I work with or consult with. And all of my peers, people I rely on to help me with the work that I do, um, they all hold different master's degrees, typically in social work, but more and more in forensic mental health counseling. And so that's sort of the first big difference. Um, and I so what will you learn? You know, pretty much what you will learn in forensic psychology, there is a slight subtle difference. And, and sometimes it doesn't need to be this way. But in our program, we really emphasize it um, on how to work with victims and offenders or victims and perpetrators. This also makes us very different from other forensic programs in the country. Um, we really feel that without understanding victimization, you will never truly understand perpetration. No one is born thinking, I want to be violent, I want to be a rapist, I want to be a serial robber. Um, most people end up in lives of crime because of poverty and trauma. And so we emphasize that. And, and what do you learn? So in, in practical ways, you learn how to talk to victims and offenders using the right language, what we call clinical manners. Um, we, you also learn assessment. This makes us closer to forensic psychology, but very different from other excellent counseling programs like Lehman College, for example. They have a very good counseling program. But what makes us different is you do a great deal of assessment. That's the forensic part. And so what is, what is assessment? Well, you might have to make decisions, for example, if you work in a hospital. You might give the person a test and then you might you might recommend that this client will do better in individual counseling, or this client actually will do better in group counseling because they need a witness to their trauma, or, or this client is actually ready to be released from prison, they're doing really well, and they need to be out there and working, right? So you would do different formal assessments. Um, and this makes us a really important program. I'll give you a little anecdote. A former student who's graduated a few years down the road contacted me about a month ago and said she's really worried, very anxious. And I said, why? And she said she's reading a forensic report written by a psychologist and the report has errors in it. And I said, oh, this is fantastic that A, you spotted the errors and why are you worried? She said, well, what should I do? I said, write a very polite letter to your boss who's on your side and say, or, or actually just call your boss and say, I, there are these errors and explain the errors. Now, why was the student able to spot the errors? because she had a thorough grounding in assessment in both forensic psych and forensic um, FMHC program. What allowed us to give her that thorough grounding? It's our prerequisites, which all of you hate, which is STATS 250 and research methods. Those prerequisites give you the formative ground to then take on more complex assessment classes. So she told her boss, there are errors. This instrument was should never have been used because it's actually, there are no norms for African-Americans. So those norms that the forensic psychologist is producing are inaccurate. Now you may not know what language, this language that I'm using, but that is what you will learn in these programs. So I wanna quickly finish by saying, don't, don't spend too much time on this, but we offer different tracks. Most of our folks do the general track and many, many of our folks take the victim certificate. We offer a victim track, but most people don't do it. Instead, of the, they take the victim certificate, that's four classes and fully applicable to your master's, and they do the general track. And um, they work all over New York, and many of our folks are now moving all over the US. We have people in California, Alaska, which is a little challenging, um, but also New Jersey, Connecticut. And they work everywhere from prisons, parole boards, um, private practice. We have a larger and larger number of students setting up their own practice, um, hospitals with the seriously mentally ill and so on and so forth. So I'll, I'll stop there and let you ask questions.
Thank you, Dr. Raghavan. We will be holding on to the questions until everyone else had a chance to present. We're going to move to Dr. Charlie Stone, uh, the head of the BAMA program. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Uh, my name is Dr. Charles Stone. I'm the director of the BAMA program in forensic psychology. Um, I do have a few slides just to help convey the information. And I'll share this with you, Anila, afterwards, and so you can um, give it to everyone. It's not much. Um, let's see. So I think one thing to keep in mind uh, is that this BAMA program, the MA component is the forensic psychology MA program. So that was Dr. Falkenbach. So basically everything Dr. Falkenbach was talking about, you can insert here and that's the MA portion of this BA MA. So this is not um, forensic mental health and counseling MA program that Dr. Raghavan was just talking about. So be, be aware of that. Um, <clears throat> so basically the BA MA program is a program in which you will complete both your MA courses and finish up your BA courses at the same time. It's an accelerated program um, so most students enter around their lower junior year. Um, and then if you are admitted, you will then start to take the MA courses again outlined in the forensic psychology program. Um, in order to apply, you must have a GPA of 3.5 or higher. Um, and that is also at the college level. So even if your GPA dips below 3.5 and, you know, I, I think it's okay, you cannot graduate with a BA MA. Um, if your DPA dips below 3.5. So you have to maintain that. Um, since it's a combined degree program, you have to complete 134 credits versus 120 to graduate. Uh, <clears throat> one of the things that a lot of students don't recognize when they do enter these programs um, is that from John Jay's perspective, you will always be considered an undergrad since you technically won't get your bachelor's degree until you graduate. Um, Sorry, some of this is overlapping between what I normally give to students when they get admitted. So some of this might not be directly relevant to you. Um, but some helpful information is, as long as you haven't completed more than 120 credits, John Jay will charge you at the undergraduate tuition. Once you go above 120 credits, you then will be charged for uh, at the graduate level. Now, the benefit of that is, in theory, it's possible for you to get into your last semester of the BAMA program and have 119 credits take five courses and then complete your BA MA degree that following semester and only pay undergraduate tuition the entire time when you get two degrees. Um, so it's a it's a way to expedite your degree process. It's a way to do it cheaper. Um, and, it, and it is a bit more prestigious in the sense that it is a competitive program um, and you have to maintain a 3.5 GPA or higher. Um, and so just like what Dr. Falkenbach was talking about, since you'll basically be just doing the MA program as Dr. Falkenbach just kind of talked about, um, you have the option of doing the externship, the thesis, or a dual track to complete your degree. Um, now, I imagine most questions are surrounding how do you apply and so forth. So um, just like the regular MA program, we have uh, two points in which you can apply for both the fall and spring. Um, the dates in which applications are do fluctuate a little bit, but generally they are always in mid to late July for the fall and early January for the winter, uh, for the spring. Now, another benefit of this program is there's no fee to apply um, and there's no GRE requirement. And this was before the pandemic. Um, so that is something that will stay regardless of what happens with the regular MA programs. Um, again, you have to have a GPA of 3.5 or higher. Um, in order to apply, you have to have between 70 and 85 credits at the time of your application. Um, and your application will include three letters of recommendation, uh, a personal statement between 700 and 750 words or a thousand, um, and then a writing sample. Uh, some other things that are recommended but are not required are to complete STATS 250, um, Psych 242, which is the abnormal, uh, Psych 311, which is research methods, and Psych 370, which is Psych and Law. Um, part of the recommendation of that is, obviously there are similar courses like that in the master's level program. And you know I won't give you permission to enroll in higher level courses if you haven't taken the more rudimentary, right? So if you're able to take stats, um, if you're able to take 242, 311, 370, before you apply, you'll be able to more um, 
quickly complete the courses at the MA level because you'll have had those kind of prerequisites out of the way. Um, and uh, more information. So all of this is outlined on our website. So if you follow this URL, it'll give you all this information about the application. And you can also get a link to the application um, site to start the, um, the process. Uh, but I think uh, that's all I have. Because uh, again, um, Dr. Falkenbach covered a lot of kind of the benefits and things that you'll require. Um, I'm imagining most of your questions for me would be kind of nuts and bolts of how you go about to apply. Um, so hopefully this will be helpful. But of course, I'll stick around for any questions people have at the end of uh, this presentation. Thank you, Dr. Stone. Um, on the chat, we had a very important comment on information from Dr. Uh, Falkenbach that the victim certificate is also available to the forensic psychology students. And then Dr. Raghavan um, also wanted to remind you that the forensic mental health counseling program is 60 credits and takes about two years, sometimes more, sometimes less. And we'll take questions at the end. Um, I would like to give the floor now to Dr. Janos, uh, the head of the clinical doctorate program. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks, Anila. Sorry if there's any background noise. One of my kids just got home from school. Uh, he's allowed to go certain days of the week. Um, I decided I will show some of the slides that I have. Um, so I'm going to be talking about the uh, clinical psychology at John Jay program. Um, so uh, for your reference, if you have not seen our website, um, I'm going to put the URL in the chat. It is uh, hosted at the Graduate Center's um, webpage, not John Jay Colleges. Okay, so I just put it in there now. You can take a look at it. Um, so just a few things. Um, uh, obviously, we are housed at John Jay, but we are also a graduate center program. Uh, if you haven't been to the graduate center, it's at 34th Street and 5th Avenue, diagonal from the Empire State Building. Um, obviously, uh, there hasn't been a lot of activity there lately, but normally uh, students in our program do go there for some classes and some meetings. Um, I know you're familiar with John Jay. Uh, presumably you've been there uh, before it shut down last year, but um, this is our psychology department conference room where most of our classes are held. Um, and this is just a shot of the, uh, what's called the shared office space where doctoral students um, sort of do their work in between classes and the like when they're on campus. So again, these are things that are not uh, very busy these days, but they uh, are there and they are part of the resources available to students at our program. Um, so as a PhD program, we accept a small number of students. Um, we were only able to accept four this year and we got um, over 400 applicants. So it's a competitive process and a difficult one, but I do wanna let you know that uh, the graduates of John Jay College and um, the BAMA program and the master's programs have um, been accepted to our program over the years, including our most recent uh, group that was accepted. So, um, you know, people do uh, make it to this level um, from the same place that you're at right now. Um, just a little bit, um, you know, we have a number of missions. So just wanted to point these out that our mission is to train ethical scientists, practitioners of clinical psychology, prepare students to become scholars, practitioners, and leaders in the academy and clinical settings. Um, we also have this um, secondary focus in addition to our overall clinical psychology focus on social justice and forensic psychology. And so um, basically we are looking to train uh, students to uh, become scientist practitioners who are equally adept in research and in the practice of clinical psychology, which in includes therapy, includes assessment, um, and to be conversant in forensic psychology issues and conversant in social justice issues. Um, I also want to note that our program is AP accredited, so we have to be responsive to the requirements of uh, you know, that accreditation, and that means there's a lot of um, core competencies that we're required to teach students to have. Um, I think I'll just show one more slide, which is you know, how do students get to this point of being uh, ready to um, do practice, to teach, to do research. 
Well, it comes from a variety of sources. It comes from the coursework that we give. Uh, it comes from direct mentoring with faculty and every student has a primary faculty advisor who they work with closely, especially on research. Um, it comes from externship training, which you do offsite. So you heard about how in the MA program, there's an externship track and you do one externship. Usually it lasts for maybe six months. Um, in our program, students do um, uh, at least three, uh, two day per week externships over the course of their training uh, for you know nine months to a year. So it's sort of longer and more diversity of experience. Students get experience in hospital settings, jail settings, outpatient treatment settings, college counseling settings. And we kind of require students to get a range of those types of experiences. And then you're not only working on research with a faculty member, you're working on your own research and students have to complete a dissertation, um, but many students complete multiple research projects over the course of their training, end up with many publications, many presentations. Uh, some students get external grants um, and really are ready to be out on their own after they've graduated. Um, generally, it takes five years to six years to complete a PhD uh, in clinical psychology. Um, our typical time to completion has been six. Uh, we have had some students who've managed to finish in five who've been focused on that. Um, so typically it takes five to six years. So it's a big chunk of time, a big commitment. Um, students are offered support. Uh, we only accept students who get tuition fellowships from the Graduate Center. And we try to arrange for every student to have some amount of support for um, most of their time, meaning some external additional money that they have so that they can focus completely on their studies. So that's all I'm gonna discuss for now, and I'm sure there'll be questions and I can go into those. Um, Thank you so much, Professor Yanos. Um, let's move on to Dr. Fondacaro, uh, the head of Psych and Law program, the doctoral program, Psych and Law. Mark. Hi everyone, I'm uh, Mark Fondacaro. I'm the director of the Psychology and Law doctoral program. And uh, there are a lot of similarities uh, with uh, between our program and Phil's and some differences. And I'll point out the, the differences uh, a little bit later on. Um, but we have, uh, our program is in psychology and law. Your degree, the degree is in that you, uh, our graduates get is in psychology through the Graduate Center. Um, and, uh, but the, uh, the students who are in our program and our, fac our faculty, we have 12 core faculty members and they're all leading scholars uh, in uh, the area of research at the interface between psychology and law. We've got 12 uh, faculty members and we've got uh, two uh, distinguished faculty members, one presidential scholar. Um, and beyond our faculty, students have access to faculty in other doctoral programs uh, throughout John Jay, um, throughout the entire city university system. Also our students uh, can take courses uh, in other institutions in the greater New York City area, for example, Fordham, Princeton, and two of my four, uh, alma maters, Columbia and Stony Brook University. Stony Brook, my favorite. Um, but uh, so, um, so in addition to our core faculty, and I would say that um, in terms of our program, it's by anybody's measure is definitely considered in the top two or three. And I think most people would consider it to be the leading program in the country, if not the world, in terms of the concentration of uh, scholars who do research in the area of psychology and law. The fact, many places that do cover psychology and law will have a one or two or a few faculty members. And the fact that we have um, 12 core faculty members is, is particularly uh, unique. Um, like the clinical program, we get a lot of applications, not nearly as many as they do. And, but, and in each year, we typically admit between three and five students this year because of a cutback, we were, we were only able to admit two students per year. But one of the things I wanna emphasize for you all is that given the, the status of the program, this really is a resource for you all that you all should take advantage of. What does that mean? When you're taking, and, and it's not just the psych and law program, I'm speaking in our behalf, but as well as the faculty and the other programs, is these are leading uh, folks in the area areas of forensic psychology, psychology and law, you should be going to their office hours and not just asking them questions about the material covered, but giving them a chance to get to know who you are. Um, when we talk about the application process, 
um, you know, trying to get some input from a professor about uh, your personal statement, not just in terms of feedback about clarifying your writing, but giving them an opportunity to read something about you, who you are, so that as they read it and give you some feedback, they get an investment in you and they know something more about you other than the fact that you just got an A plus in their class, right? Um, and so even if, so for example, if we're only taking two students and there's way, there are way more students among you all here who are qualified um, and would be fantastic students, but even if you don't get into the program, you should use your John Jay experience as a resource because the faculty members are all well known and have are well networked and so serve as really valuable resources for you to be able to call on them to write letters of recommendation uh, that will get you into a program if you don't get into this program. Um, now, one of the one of the uh, one way to increase your likelihood of getting into any program is to get involved in research early, right? So you want to try to get involved in research. Certainly for our psych and law program, uh, one of the things that we look at is uh, your research interests, to what extent they align with the kind of research that's being done by faculty members in our program, and just um, uh, your commitment to uh, research. So it's important to get involved in research, even if you don't think that ultimately uh, you want to become a professor. Most of our students do go into academic positions. I think it's something like 70% of our students are doing teaching or research positions. Uh, some students will uh, who graduate from our program go into trial consulting. Others work in public institutions. So for example, my students have uh, gotten jobs at the Vera Institute for Justice, uh, the um, uh, Every Town for Gun Safety, um, the uh, uh, um, the uh, Center for Policing Equity. So these are places where people are doing policy relevant research. Um, in terms of the kinds of research that our faculty members do, it kind of varies between sort of micro to macro to the micro is the sort of social science in the law. So people doing research on eyewitness identification, false confessions, uh, on sort of intermediate is, is, is jury selection. We do uh, then, uh, I do some research on police citizen interactions on up to uh, policy reform in the area of juvenile and adult criminal justice on the more macro side. Um, and uh, what else can I say? Um, and again, I just think that it's important that you all recognize and, and use this program at the programs, all of the programs that John Jay and the faculty as a resource, whether you decide to come here or wanna go somewhere else, um, and one of the best ways to do that is to get involved in research and to spend time, take advantage of the opportunities you have uh, through office hours with your faculty. And then I'll answer any, oh, the other thing is that all of the students who are admitted, like, well, all of the students admitted to our program, it's a, usually a five-year program. All the students are, uh, um, get their tuition covered and a stipend that's set now at almost $27,000 a year. So, um, uh, so that's in addition to having your uh, tuition covered and uh, health insurance uh, for a nominal fee. Um, so uh, that's, I think, one of the advantages of, 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 uh, of the doctoral programs is the, taking some of the pressure off, the financial pressures off. With that, I'll stop. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Fondacaro. Um, so as I said in the chat, we are moving to the Q&A session. Uh, please either raise your hand and we will unmute you at that point. You can also submit your questions in the chat. We have already received the first question um, and this is for Dr. Stone. Uh, since the BAMA program for forensic psychology is competitive, how many students are typically accepted? Thank you for your question. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it, it kind of varies, but generally the cohorts range between um, 15 and 25. Um, per semester. Thank you. And we have another question. Most of the programs are highly competitive. How many competitive, how competitive is it to get into the forensic mental health counseling graduate program, Dr. Raghavan? Okay, so we need a minimum of 3.0 and at least to be in statistics and research methods. But we also, um, most of our students 
are between 3.5 and 4, most of our applicants. But we also look at sort of the whole picture. A lot of students, their first year in college don't do well, which pulls down their GPA. And so we look to see if your GPA goes up your second year and your third year. Um, some students are fantastic, but they happen to not do well in stats or research methods. We then ask them to just retake the class and we admit them conditionally, or we um, suggest that they start coursework through the victim certificate while repeating stats and research methods. So the simple answer is we are very competitive, but we're also loving and flexible. Thank you. Um, and we have a question uh, as well, follow up to the scholarships available in the mental health counseling program. I'm afraid not. And I know nothing is really cheap, but you know, for what it's worth, we're one of the cheapest programs in the country. We are so cheap that out-of-state people come all the time, and even out-of-state fees were still cheaper than a lot of other master's programs. Um, and I, I wish we had money, but we don't. Thank you, Dr. Raghavan. Um, a follow-up question. This is uh, from Sam for, uh, for Dr. Uh, Falkenbach. Could you explain the capstone experiences more in depth? Uh, Didi, you're on mute. Sorry. Hi, sorry about that driving. So um, I'm happy to answer those. So, so that you have a choice in forensic psychology between doing 300 hours of externship. Um, and in 98% of those cases, it's a clinical externship. So you're going to a place like, um, like Rikers or, um, Kings County Hospital or a juvenile justice center or the mental health court, or you're going somewhere um, and you're going to do 300 hours of clinical work and um, with most of those actual direct client hours. And so depending on the place, some are more assessment, some are more therapy, um, but it is real life work with the populations you're interested in. Um, and then the other option is a thesis option, which is just that you're going to create and conduct your own independent research under the advisement of one of our faculty members. Everybody's been talking about our amazing faculty. And one thing I'm not sure is always clear is that we have a psychology department faculty. And so for the MA programs, the faculty for the MA programs is our full psychology faculty. Um, and then the doctoral programs split these up into more sort of clinically er clinical areas and more psych and law areas. Um, so any of our faculty can supervise our students. Um, and most of our students are involved in their research labs anyway, but you find someone who's willing to supervise you on the topic that you're interested in. And then you create and you conduct your own research study, you write it up, you defend it in front of the committee, and then you have completed your thesis. Some students do choose to do both, right? So you've heard how competitive it is to get into the doctoral programs. So often students that are looking to go into clinical doctoral programs will do both a clinical placement and the research. Um, but that is a more um, challenging track, obviously, as a lot more. Uh, thank you, Dr. Falkenbach. Before I go to the student, uh, Phil, did you have a follow-up? I just wanted to add a little bit about the thesis process since I'm working with six or seven, I don't know exactly how many students right now who are working on their thesis at different stages of it. And just that, um, you know, uh, look for a faculty member whose work you're interested in, you know, look at their webpage and the research and ask to talk to them. And you can get a sense of what's uh, going on with the work that they're doing and see if there's a way to develop an idea together. And you may be thinking, well, how could I do a research project? Well, it starts with an idea and it starts with, um, you know, interest in something. And then the faculty member will give you um, paths to make it happen. Um, and you learn from your peers in the research lab. So for students that work with me, I have them, you know, come to the lab meetings, hear what the other students are doing, and then they gradually kind of see like, oh, this is what people are doing, this is what we can do. 
and um, they are able to develop their thesis. It does take a while to develop and to carry out and to do, but I think it's a very rewarding experience and um, one that certainly would help with applying to further doctoral or other kinds of graduate studies. And um, I think many students really uh, find it to be a valuable component. Thank you, Phil. Um, I'm gonna go to Andrea. Hi, my name is Andrea. Um, quick question, just overarching for anybody that's willing to answer. Um, with the pandemic and possibly students faltering in their grades or having taken a credit option instead of taking that as uh, counting towards their GPA, has that affected any students um, being accepted into your guys' programs or just their acceptance in general? You know, I look at the whole picture. So if the student has lots of A's and a few B's, the credit, no credit, and has experience and wants to do the program for the right reasons, it's a strong application, it doesn't bother me. If the student is not very strong and doesn't have great experience and doesn't have a great statement, then it does affect me. But in and of itself, you know, it's, you know, obviously we offer the credit, no credit because of difficulty, right? So to count it against the student would be really, I think, counterproductive. So it's the, you know, one individual thing is not going to harm you or hurt you. It's really the overall. Thank you, Dr. Falkenbach. Um, we have a GRE question, if we can revisit it. Um, are the GRE scores again required? And if a student sends it for this year, will they be taken into consideration even though they're being waived for the fall? Uh, can I, uh, which program are you talking about? Because the... Well, we can answer it for all. Uh, Emily, would you like to clarify or we can answer it simply, but the general question is if we send the GRE scores this year, Will they be taken into consideration? Um, Emily is interested in the forensic psychology MA program. Uh, Didi, are you there? Hi, sorry, technical difficulty. Um, yes, so um, yes, send it, please. Um, assuming you're above 297. Um, that's the short answer. Um, what was the other part of the question besides, would we um, consider it if you send it? And what was the other part? Sorry. And are they being waived for the fall as well? Yes, so they are currently being waived for fall. Um, and my guess is likely also for next spring, but that decision hasn't formally been made. And we have a follow-up question for you, Dr. Falkenbach. So if we wanted to become a clinical child psychologist and we will not be planning to going into the law, in your opinion, would it be wise to apply to John Jay for the master's program? We, the program had, offers an option for more broad clinical courses um, and it is very clinically focused. But if you're not really interested in the forensic component, you're going to be, you're going to have a lot of forensic information being thrown at you that you don't necessarily are going, you know, you're not going to care about so much. Now you can choose your courses so you don't need to take the more forensic electives, but in something like clinical interviewing, they're going to talk about clinical interviewing and how that is specifically different in forensic settings, right? So I think you, you could do fine and, um, and you could make your way through that in a way to get the information that you really are hoping to get. But, you know, you're going to have to hear a lot of things you might not be so excited about. I want to jump in quickly on that. The training to be a child psychologist is quite different from adult in many ways. And we don't really, we're really adult and adolescent focused. And so we have lots of classes on adolescent assessment, meaning um, 12 and above but we really don't have anything on child. And so if you really know you want to work with eight and below, you should look for a master's program that has a strong concentration in child so that you become more competitive. If you don't actually know what you mean by child psychology, that's different. You know, it's so child is, and others can jump in, but that would be why, that would be another reason to consider or not consider. All, all of that said, we have, 
uh, three or four faculty that specifically work with um, juvenile and um, so again, more adolescents, but we do have a few people on our faculty that are working specifically with children and our, we have a developmental course, but we really do not have a focus in that area. Okay, it looks like we are coming to the end of the program. Um, I just wanna check the chat one more time. Um, Okay, we have one more question, and I guess this will be the last question, so now we conclude. Uh, but I would encourage some of our speakers, they entered their contact information in the chat. I would encourage everyone to put their contact information. If students have further questions, they could follow up. And of course, you can contact me and Dr. Wout, and we will um, refer you to the appropriate program. Uh, we have one more question uh, from Nusrat. Let's say someone didn't do well in their statistics class, how would you rate their application? Would they still have a chance of getting accepted? It's a B or higher. So if you get lower than a B, the answer is no. I would have you retake it, particularly if the rest of your GPA is good or if you've had interesting experiences. Um, that's for FMHC. I don't know how the other programs do it, but you need to get a B or higher because you will need statistics to learn assessment. Forensic psychology is the same. So we require a B or better in statistics, but if you didn't get it and everything else in your application is strong, then we will just have you come in um, and retake that course, or you can take it over the summer before you start or some version of it. But you will eventually, or before you can get too far into the program, you have to be able to successfully complete that course. All right. Um, thank you so much. I want to thank the panelists, our distinguished faculty for being with us here today, sharing their information about each program. And I want to wish all the students happy Ramadan for those of you who celebrate it. And I, let's, give, um, let's give the floor to Dr. Wout for closing remarks. And this will be posted on our website uh, as we are recording. Thank you all. Dr. Wout. Well, I hope that you all were able to um, learn a little bit more about our programs, hopefully build some connections between yourselves and the members of our department. Um, definitely feel free to reach out to any of us if you have any more questions. Um, the goal is here to kind of provide you with the resources that you would need to be strong applicants to not just our programs, but to any of the graduate programs that you want to apply to. So definitely, um, Consider us a resource and, and use us as much as you can. Um, I again want to thank you all for coming. I want to thank the directors for coming. And most of all, I'd like to thank Anila for organizing this session and for moderating it. Um, she really cares about you guys. So um, you should be very grateful that you have her as kind of helping to guide you all through this process. Yeah, take care, everybody. <laughs>